Good morning, everybody. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanking God for this opportunity. Let us bow before the Lord this morning. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, yes, we Lord. thank you, God, that we are able to make the most out of this day. Yes. You are our Redeemer, Father. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are our Hallelujah. Lord. You are our shield. Yes. You are our fortress and our strength. It yes. is your power to yes. give us what we need to get well. So we yes. thank you this morning. We thank you for this meeting, dear Heavenly Father. And we ask God that you will enable us to use this precious gift from this study in a way that you will get glory out of it. Yes. Out of it and that others will be edified. We thank you now for thank helping you. us to achieve every goal that we set out to accomplish on this day. Yes. And we ask God that you continue to show us your faithfulness, bless the leaders mm -hmm. of this group, God, and all of the attendees at this time set aside for right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus name. Jesus' name, amen. amen. See, that's how that's how that's how you set it off. Right. This is how that's how you set this piece off. Praise the Lord, powerful prayer. I felt something a few times. Glory. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So uh, again, we want to just welcome you. Uh, man, this this has always been a, a powerful experience with Greater Providence. Uh, your spirit is just amazing. You're just awesome people of God. And uh, once this weather breaks and, and, and Rona gone or whatever, <laughs> I, I got to come and, and, and worship with you all. Amen. So, uh, uh, but again, we're just excited to be back. Um, and I think we are part uh, on lesson what le lesson four, mm -hmm. lesson four. But just uh, just the conversations about wealth, the the curriculum that we're learning, and the action steps that we're taking, we cannot help but be blessed when we follow the principles of intergenerational wealth. And so we're just excited that we're back on, and we're just looking forward to a powerful class <clears throat> even this morning. So. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. So by now, you guys know who we are. Uh, yeah. But just in case we have any newcomers. <laughs> Administrator and CFPI. Right. You also have Joyce Palmer, who's uh, also CFPI, which means Certified Financial Education um, Instructor as well as Reverend Sean Weaver, who's our WINS director. So um, again, happy to have you all here with us on this journey. Um, as Sean said, we're, what, on class four. So wow. this is our fourth mm -hmm. time together and it's, it's been great so far and let's, let's keep it going. Um, one thing I just like to recap and always bring our attention back to is just, you know, our goals. Why are we here? What, what is this all about? Um, clearly intergenerational wealth, as Sean mentioned, is something that our community um, needs um, to catch up in, <laughs> in all honesty. So, and that starts with education. It starts with financial literacy. It starts with understanding um, how to accumulate and build and preserve wealth. So in this class, um, we have four main goals to, to motivate you, which again, I can tell that you are because you're sticking with us, you're here for each class, um, but also to engage you in conversation and discussion about um, foundational principles as they relate to um, just understanding money and how to be better stewards of that so we can be on that path towards intergenerational wealth. Um, and with that comes, you know, education. Some of this may be new to some and old news for others. But again, it's all just making sure we're looking at the same facts and um, understanding the foundational principles. And then at the end of the day, wherever you are, um, the goal is just to move into action, apply what you're learning. And that could range from um, the smallest thing of just having a conversation with your child or your grandchild about um, building wealth and understanding the value of money. Um, it could be um, updating your budget and actually following your budget. It could be, um, you know, in working on your retirement plan and um, you know making steps with money you've already accumulated. So there's a wide range wherever you are, it's all about moving to action and to continue moving forward on this journey. Um, 
as Sean mentioned, we are what in our fourth class, we've covered financial psychology, uh, budgeting, and last time we talked about credit. Today, we're gonna address loans and debt. And then just looking ahead, our last two classes are gonna cover risk management and retirement planning. So um, just wanted to come provide that background and let's see what else we have. Right, well, obviously the foundation of scripture that Ms. Uh, Reverend, Reverend Higgs, Minister Higgs have been, she said the last time that she's been speaking this and standing on this foundational principle for a long time and she's seen manifestation. So this is not theory. This, these are principles that when are applied, they bring results. And so once we start um, uh, trusting God's word and establishing it in our heart and taking action, faith without corresponding actions is dead, we will see re results. And so our foundational scripture says, you shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he who gives you power. I mean, we could stop right there. He gives us power for every circumstance in our lives. We have the ability to overcome. In fact, we're more than conquerors. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to, you know, see, Miss Higgs, you, you started this with that prayer this morning. <laughs> but I'm not going to preach today. But he, he gives us power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. God wants his covenant to permeate the earth through God's people. That's why he's equipping us with the wealth, because we know that that's what we need to do that. Uh, and he swore unto our fathers as it is to, the, to this day. And so that's our foundational scripture, recognizing that God wants us wealthy, but it's not for us to uh, hoard it. It's not for us to be so materialistic that we're buying things that we don't necessarily need. Um, but it's it's to provide for the kingdom. And so uh, keep that in mind. And then we have our four pillars of intergenerational wealth. Uh, the first one, proper management of, of the accumulated wealth, making sure you're managing uh, what you have. Uh, and then the proper insurance, proper insurance. And we've talked about that 60% of all wealth transference is, is through the strategic and tactical placement of life insurance. And then home ownership. We want you to own your own home. And when we mean own your own home, meaning you don't owe the mortgage any longer. And so own your own home in 15 years or less. And that's a reason for that because now you have equity, uh, less interest and all those types of things that we'll talk about. And then business development. You know, God has given you a gift uh, learn how to monetize that particular gift um, and recognize that, you know, the tax codes are, are made for the business owner. Um, and so when you understand that, you can take advantage of some, some tax situations as well. And so those are the four pillars of which the curriculum that we've been talking about these last four weeks are really centered around. And most of the curriculum of the 72, 73 module curriculum is is basically uh, geared around these four pillars. All right. So, Joyce, if you can just go ahead and recap in terms of. Yeah, I was. Um, I'm, if I was going to go back to um, I'll just recapping some of the highlights um, for my benefit, I think sometimes it's good because I'm getting older, so my memory is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> so, but our first first lesson was talking about psychology of money. Um, I'm just want to put a quiz question out there to see how many other people has great memories like mine, but we talked about psychology and money and one of the big takeaways I think we talked about there was how we learn life uh, through our life experiences, through our church, through our home, through our community, we have developed certain philosophies or money habits and how those habits dictate either good or bad, what we do sometimes when we're building money. So um, anybody yet remember one of their psychology of money revelations that they had, something that they um, picked up from that first class, psychology of money? That's good. Nobody else remember psychology of money but me? <laughs> <laughs> Give him a minute. Um, you can raise your hand or um, just come, come off, off mute. mute and share. Yeah. 
I see Janet's thing. I see Janet's mouth moving. I think she's thinking about what she oh, remembers. Uh, <laughs> Oh. What the, the reason my mouth is moving, Miss Joyce, is because I'm I'm uh, connecting with you as far as the memory is concerned. Okay. I'm trying to say <laughs> psychology, psychology. What did I remember? Um, but I think one of the things I took away, and this may help trigger some memories, is that um, in my home I used to hear all the time, "Money don't grow on trees," right? So as a little person, when I heard that it usually equated to it something I couldn't get, right? Mm -hmm. If I asked for something and I heard that statement. So throughout, I always equated money don't grow on trees, meaning, you know, a lot of things you can't get, you can't have. So it was a limiting, in my opinion, a limiting uh, belief that I couldn't have certain things because money didn't grow on trees. So some of our um, habits that we've heard or learned can limit us and then in return, some of them can empower us. Um, mm -hmm. I think someone mentioned that their grandparents were really good about teaching them how to save money and putting a little bit of, of money away um, every week and they built off of that. So that was a good habit or good uh, you know, memory that one had. Fifi puts in here wants versus needs being a mindful spender, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and Joyce, I was going to add just even on that note of, again, us um, being of that age where things are, you know, you forget a little easier. Um, yeah. I think that that applies to the financial psychology in the way that um, many of us, we have to focus on renewing our mind every day. Um, we've been programmed and conditioned for so many years as far as being a consumer. I think mm -hmm. a lot of us oh in general are we're good at consuming and going out and spending, but you know, changing our mind, undoing some of that um, influence that's been bombarded on us for years, and renewing our mind towards okay, I, I want to save, I want to be strategic, or I want to invest. I have to renew my mind on how I'm thinking about how I use money and what mm -hmm. um, and not being emotional about money. So I, I think that applies as well. So that's what yeah. I take away from financial psychology. It's just changing yeah. our mindset. That was good. That was good. Someone even said something about um, about they program us marketing. They're always mm -hmm. marketing to us. Um, and that, that yeah. marketing is done intentionally to, to lead us to spending that way. Someone else yeah. mentioned that. Scotty, um, smart goals and three words that help us attain goals. Good. Yeah, that was one of that was, that's what we covered in yes. um, budgeting and spending. We talked about smart goals. Good. So memories are starting to come back. Okay. Um, and Joyce, let, let me say, this is Jan. And um, mm -hmm. I just want to say that since taking the class, I am more mindful. Those 20% uh, off uh, coupons and 30% <laughs> off coupons are still coming in. But uh -huh. uh, to God be the glory, truly, yeah. since um, and those things that may cost $2 that, that, I, that I don't need, that I'm just hoarding right. away. I am more mindful now and I'm not spending, you know, my sister is an HSN person and she called me last night. Oh, they've got a Yonla's on there with the skincare. I think I'm going to buy that, you know, and, and, and I'm not an HSN person, but uh -huh. you know, uh, just people, you know, can put stuff out there to you. And next thing you know, Oh, I need that. And I'm down, uh -huh. but I uh -huh. truly am. Uh, and I'm learning and I am finding that I am literally finding extra money now. Because I'm not just, you know, thinking, awesome. okay, because this is 30% off, I've got to have it. So this class is really and truly blessing me. Thank you all. Amen. That's, that's, awesome. that's great. That's great. That's great. You know, I love to hear people finding money, right? <laughs> and then the next step, once we, like you said, change our mindset and we start looking at it differently, we find the money. Then like um, the next step is how do we use and maximize that money, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Take it to the whole level level. Yeah. Um, Mary said, um, uh, can't change reality until we change our mentality. That's it. That's it, Miss yep. Mary. Yep. That's good. That's good, Sister Mary. Um, 
What about we also, when we did the budgeting and the spending, um, we learned a little bit more about how to discern wants versus needs. And I remember we had a really good conversation on wants versus needs. And I said, I really need my shoes. Those were needs. And then we <laughs> talked about, well, it depends on what kind of shoe it was. I didn't really need the red bottoms, but I could <laughs> get away with the, but so we talked about the difference between rubber bottoms and, wants and how they cross each other. You guys remember that? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Um, the next thing um, we, we talked about smart goals. I think Scotty put that in there. Um, smart goals. Anybody remember the definition of a smart goal by any chance? Ooh, that's a tough one. I have my own. This is Reverend Higgs. <laughs> okay, okay. That will take that. <laughs> okay. Is it specific? Is it yeah. measurable? Yeah. Is it attainable? All yes. Right. Can I find a result? Yes. And is it time driven? All right, all right, all right. Excellent. All right. Excellent. That's, that's a smart goal. There you go. And when you kind of use each one of those when you're looking at setting your goals, you try to take in perspective. Is it um, specific? Does it have a, you know, is it something that's measurable? Can we? measure it needs to be um a tough goal but yet achievable right mm -hmm. we don't want to make it too easy but you don't want to make it too difficult that you can't reach it either so um achievable relevant or results based mm -hmm. and in a timeline awesome thank you nice. good stuff okay. and good then stuff. the last week which everybody should remember this we talked about credit um and how a it's a financial it's our financial reputation our credit mm -hmm. score and how it can impact things that we do whether it's um getting a job whether it's you know obviously trying to apply for credit for something and how that reputation uh, with our credit repair our credit has an impact on things that we do we also talked about um, what makes up a credit score and how sometimes when you take something off, you think it's gonna reduce your credit, but it really didn't because there's so many different things that make up that credit score and how um, how good credit just is, you know, something that we gotta continuously work on. Um, some people shared some stories. I know I shared mine, you know, my college days right out of college and coming out of college with all these credit cards and um, affecting my credit score day one when I'm starting my, you know, right out of school was, you know, a challenge. And so a lot of times we, we don't realize how much it impacts it until we, you know, sit back and look at what's going on with the credit. So those were, um, those were the areas I just wanted to recap, make sure everybody was, memory was still working. <laughs> so, but that was good. So that um that brings us to now we we're talking about um debt. Loans and debt. Yes. Good stuff. Thank you, Joyce, for warming up our, our minds and our memories and getting us on to the next step. So yes, this class we're talking about loans and debt. And really um want to start off the lesson by discussing, you know, good debt versus bad debt. Um, some may think any and all debt is bad. Some may think, you know, there is a such as good debt. So I wanted to kind of start off defining um, what those two look like. So if there's anyone that would like to share either in the comment box or raise your hand and come off mute, just what's your definition or an example of good debt or bad debt? If anyone can share on that or just your thoughts on it. I would think that uh, good debt is something that uh, is n necessary. Uh, for instance, when I went to college, the college loan um, to offset my scholarship, when I bought my first house, when I bought my car, things of mm -hmm. that nature. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a good debt. Good mm -hmm. debt. Okay. So for paying for education, a loan for education, loan mortgage, loan for a home. And what else did you mention? Was it three or two? 
Oh my God, what that, what that memory go? Right, right, right. That's what you want to remember. I'm a house going to college and back. Okay, my 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 college uh, education, my Amen. house and a car. Yeah. Okay, Amen. look, it's not just you, Miss Mary. <laughs> it's not Amen. just me. That's it. That's good to know. Amen. All right. So, a loan for education, or for a home, or for a car. Um, anyone got an example or thoughts on bad debt? How do we define bad debt? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Any hands coming up? I don't see any hands. <laughs> Let me scroll down and see if I see any hands. Because if we don't know what bad that is, Lord help us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a problem. Go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. The bad debt is <laughs> the bad debt is the credit cards for all the stuff that we purchased when we didn't have the money to pay for. Mm. Mm. That's, <laughs> it. That's it. That about sums it up. That's good. So, That's yeah. good. So, um, Jimmy, did you still want to add anything to that? Yes. I, I'd say a bad debt is if you're buying anything that doesn't appreciate in value is Ooh. bad debt. All right. All right. That's, wow. good. That's good. So you guys are hitting on it. Um, basically, you know, from our curriculum, we define good debt is the kind we use to buy assets like real estate or stocks or in a business. It's something where um, when we purchase something with that, that debt, that we acquire, it's something that's going to appreciate in value so that we increase our wealth over time. Which you're still paying for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah. Yes. They put in the chat something that you no longer have, but you're still paying for. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. really bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that when you go out on a date in college and you pay for dinner with a credit card and you're paying the minimum and you're still paying it 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah. The meal is long gone. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, look, see, see, I wasn't going to bring this up, but she brought up this whole college piece. So Kim and I met in college and, you know, when I met Kim, Kim had a car. I'm like, oh, wow, she got a car. I didn't have no car. I was on, I was on public transportation, whatever. And so we would go out and she would pay for dinner. I'm like, oh Lord, not, not all the time, but a lot of the times. Yeah, a lot of times you forget your wallet. I, I would forget my wallet, you know. <laughs> and leave me with the bill. <laughs> and so, but she would pay with this credit card. And I'm like, all right, okay, sounds great. And so, you know, three years of dating, we get married and lo and behold, <laughs> I get racked with all this debt. <laughs> and so I said it was bad debt, but it was good debt because yeah. it got to Kim oh, Weaver. Hey! Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 Mary put in there payday pay loans bad, yeah. are a bad debt. Yes, right, they are. That's it. It's not, we define bad debt as loans we use to purchase items that go down in value. They depreciate. So um, mm -hmm. let's look at. I think a, Scotty had a good one too. I don't know if you saw that one. Oh, good debt read it. can easily become bad debt when not used properly. Thank wow. you. That's key. Because that, that's, that's, that is so important. Go Scotty ahead. or Carol, if you want to share more about that, because I think yeah, that's I a very critical point to understand. Um, mm -hmm. You know, acquiring, so buying a house is. Bad is when not used properly. That's true. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This is Carol. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Hey, Carol. Good morning. A, lot of, a lot of times we um, <clears throat> go out and purchase things and at the time, or we get a credit card for emergency purposes. So those are good things, but then we turn around and we start using it improperly or we only pay the minimum amount and we allow the interest to accrue yeah. or we don't pay attention to the interest rate and not realize that we're paying more interest than we are yeah. principal. Yes. Um, and in reference to like student loans, they help you get your education. But then if you don't go ahead and take care of it and you let it linger paying the minimum, it becomes a life hole prison, a lifelong prison that you're in mm -hmm. forever <laughs> trying to take care of it. So you have to make good choices on how to keep the good debt, good debt 
before it becomes yes. bad dad. Yeah, so important, so important. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Good debt to bad mm -hmm. debt. And then, okay, another one, unsecured loans are normally bad debt. Institutions are risk-based. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's good. George, you want, to, you want to share on that? That's that's good info. That's that's real good. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead, yeah, George. Go ahead. Well, um, normally, uh, lenders, institution, base their interest rate, what they charge you on risk. And and unsecured loans are risk, meaning the things I think Jimmy just mentioned, personal car, personal loans, credit cards, things of that nature. So that goes back to what we talked about the last time, having good credit, mm -hmm. because that means you have bad risk. And institutions have risk, also have interest rate spreads. Yeah, That's right. They have to make up. So the higher the risk, the more they have to charge you. So mm -hmm. that we have to keep in mind. Yes, good point. Good stuff, good stuff. Good debt, bad debt. I thought I saw one more hand. Oh, oh Lionel. Yeah, Lionel, Lionel, Lionel. Lionel. Go ahead, Brother Lionel. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to add, while we consider credit card debt as bad debt, we know it's bad debt, but I would like to add that, you know, a lot of times we talked about college and starting out, you know, you have to get yourself established. So, you know, the easiest way to do it is with credit cards. I would say excessive credit card debt. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. So you said credit card debt may not necessarily be bad debt. It's the excessive credit cards and the excessive use of credit cards. Yeah, it may come down to the use of credit cards versus the debt. Because again, you can utilize Absolutely. your credit cards to build up credit. And as long as you're paying it off, ideally every month, you're not leaving a debt on there, but you're properly utilizing that credit to build up your credit score which then helps you like um, George was just saying, as far as getting loans for other um, asset and equity building opportunities. Mm -hmm. So good point. Jimmy, did you have your hand raised or that was from a- Yeah, kind of touch what I was about to say. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. So all good points and um, let us take a moment. I wanna share a video, it's about three minutes long, I think, um, but it just talks about opportunities and approaches for paying off debt. So if you've accumulated some debt, um, what's the best strategy for reducing and or eliminating that debt? So let's um, view that and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Strategies for paying down debts. If you've ever been in debt, you know it can feel like running on a treadmill. Every month, you pay a little to this loan, a little to that card, and eventually, you feel like you've gotten, well, nowhere. But it doesn't have to be that way. Not if you have a debt repayment strategy in place, one that helps you map out a plan that's realistic enough to follow. Stick to the plan, and before you know it, you'll be moving in the right direction, chipping away at your debt. For this discussion, let's focus on high-interest credit card debt. So let's get started. While there are many ways you can attack your debt, there are two schools of thought in particular that we'll discuss here. The first is commonly referred to as the snowball method. It's when you pay off your debts by balance, the lowest first. Another tried and true method is to pay your debts according to their interest rates, starting with the highest rates first. For this discussion, let's call it the high rate method. So how do these strategies actually work? Let's start with the snowball method. First, Make a list of all of your credit card balances from lowest amount to highest. If two balances are similar, prioritize the card with the higher interest rate. When you pay your monthly bills, make the minimum payment due for all of your debts. Then take any additional money you have available and put it toward the debt with the smallest balance. Do this each month until you've paid off your smallest debt. When you pay it off, don't use that account again until your debt is cleared up. Whether you hide the card in a drawer freeze the card in a block of ice, or close the account. The point is to stop increasing your debt. The next step is to take the money you are paying toward that bill and apply it to the next smallest balance on your list. And as you continue moving down your list, the amount you're able to pay to each balance continues to grow and grow, creating, wait for it, a snowball effect. You might be amazed how quickly that can happen. Now let's talk about the high rate method. Again, make a list of all your debts but instead arrange them according to their interest rates with the highest interest rate first. Using this method, you'll also pay the minimum amount due across the board. Then, 
you'd focus on sending as much as you can afford to the account with the highest interest rate. Keep doing that until it's paid off. Once your balance is zero, concentrate on the card with the next highest rate on your list, and so on. Either of these methods can be a great way to get yourself out of debt, and while both methods have their supporters, it's really up to you to decide what works best. Supporters of the snowball method say that you'll feel a boost each time you pay off an account, and those small victories keep you motivated to reach your goal. In fact, a study published in the Journal of Marketing Research says that the act of closing accounts after they're paid off, regardless of size, is a better predictor of whether you'll get out of debt in the long run. On the other hand, supporters of the high-rate method will tell you that over time, you'll save much more money and get out of debt sooner by paying off your higher interest rate debts first. What's right for you? Well, it's a personal choice. But if you want to get out of debt paying as little as possible, it's probably a savvier decision to use the high-rate method because you'll get rid of your most expensive debt sooner and pay less over the long run. But if you're the type of person who has trouble sticking to a plan, or if you need constant motivation, then the snowball method might be a better fit for you. Oh, one more thing. There are some instances where you might not want to go it alone. Like, let's say you're unable to make your minimum payment, or you're having a difficult time making ends meet otherwise. If that's the situation you're in, you might benefit from talking to a certified financial professional. But it's important that you look for one who works for an accredited, non-profit consumer credit counseling agency and is a member of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. Whatever you choose to do, the most important thing is that you've decided to get yourself out of debt in the first place. And with some determination, dedication, and a plan, you can get out of debt once and for all. And that's something that you really can't put a price on. Amen. So great, great video, great video. And, and so the reality is what there, there are some strategies, you know, if you are in debt, if you have some level of debt, there are some strategies that we can activate to pay those debts off. You know, the scripture in Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs uh, 22 and 7 says that the rich rules over the poor and, and the, the borrower is a slave to the lender. And so, you know, when, we, when we're when we laden with so much debt, we become a slave uh, to the lenders. And so we may have a, a job or a career, but we're working for MasterCard. We're working for Discover. We're, we're working for, you know, Visa, because that's who we are in debt to. That's who, who, who we owe. And so, you know, the Bible said, oh, no man, nothing but to, to love him. And so we have to have and execute strategies to get out of this debt so we are free. You know, Jesus came and, and, and died for our, our debt, our sin debt, but every debt, every debt, he's, and that's why we have the power to overcome all these debt situations, but we need to execute it with a particular strategy. And here we just saw two strategies that we can implore and it's really based on your psychology your mindset where you are what 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 you what, what your goals are and what you really want to accomplish and so what i want to ask is you know what strategy sounds good to you or and, and why if someone can come off mute and just kind of share what you heard within this video uh, what strategy sounds appealing to you and why this is Janet. Um, I actually did, I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. I actually did the snowball effect years ago when I was young and my credit was, you know, it was it, there was nothing on it and people were allowing me to get credit cards. And before I knew it, I had like 14. So I researched and I found the snowball effect. I didn't hear about the second one, but I actually did the snowball effect where you make the minimum payment on all of them and you pay one down and then you add whatever you were paying monthly until you just go uh, until everything is cleared. And for me, that's the one that worked for me because I like seeing those uh, those debts, you know, those cards being, you know, down at a zero, at zero, at zero, at zero. So that's something I keep in mind even now. I'm not indebted like I was then, but, you know, like I say, I have some credit cards that uh, I just, you know, charge a little something and um, pay them off every month, you know, to keep it going because they will close the account 
uh, and that you know, it's kind of a strike against your credit. So the snowball effect has worked for me and still works for me. That's awesome, Miss Janet. And what, one thing I did hear you say uh, was number one, that you didn't hear about another meth method, but you, you, you did hear about the snowball method and, and it worked because you pretty much liked the idea of getting small victories and you can celebrate, hey, I got that one paid off, I got that one paid off. And so that really helped inspire you to continue. So that's awesome. You know, that worked well for you because of who you are and you know who you are. Awesome, great stuff, great stuff. Any, anyone else? Anybody else? Uh, yes, this is Reverend Hayes. I just lost my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we got you. Okay, I'll go ahead and talk anyway. When we moved from New York to Charlotte a few years ago, I was paying on a credit card and every month it had the same balance. And I could not understand what was going on for six months. I just kept paying on the card. Come to find out when I did a research on my statement, they had raised the finance charge and I did not know it. So what oh, I was yeah. paying each month but still kept me in a reels by $1. And I was getting a $25 late charge each month because I wasn't paying the amount that was necessary. And I didn't know it. But after I found out, of course, I did something about it. Since I've been taking this class, whoo, I had four credit cards. And today is what Sister uh, Minister Jan just said, is zero, 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 zero. I mean, do you? And that's where hero is the that's, hero. That's right. that's right. That's right. So I thank God for this class. I thank God for this class. Amen. 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 Miss Miss Mary, that that's so powerful. I got chill bumps. That's that's so huge. Well, I got um, them when I saw those zeros. <laughs> I know that's right. Amen. Amen. And, and so, so with that though, how does how does reducing or or eliminating your debt help you achieve your dreams? How mm. does how does that you know by eliminating those debt? How does that help you anybody to to to, to fulfill your dreams? Well, what happened with me? I went out. My husband and I put our heads together. We bought a rental property on last year, on last year before I had back surgery. We bought it in an area that I, they were doing construction work. They were doing major projects on that in that area. So we saw the potential in it. Okay, we bought the house for a hundred and forty thousand. And to and this week we decided that I can no longer do that. It wasn't any problem with the renters or anything. Um, but the thing is, we are uh, will be seventy five next year, God willing. And so, what we decided to do was put it on the market since it is a seller's market. And they gave me an offer that we accepted from a hundred forty thousand dollar house in nine months of two hundred sixteen thousand. Glory! You better say it again. Glory! <laughs> Hey man, that's how you do that. Man, I couldn't be your neighbor, boy. I could not be your neighbor. Lord have mercy. That's wow. That's that's awesome. So it helps you fulfill your dreams because if you were in laden with debt, you wouldn't have been able to do. You wouldn't have been able to execute uh, right. that particular opportunity. Amen. Good word. Good word. Good word. Congratulations. Woo. Amen. And um, it is the power of the Lord that gives us the wealth to do it. Just that's exactly right. And we got to proclaim that. That's yeah. exactly right. Mm -hmm. I see Brother Jimmy's hand. Well, one thing that happens is once the, you, you get out of debt, the interest you were paying now becomes an investment opportunity. Yeah. Wow. And then you can take that credit card that you were paying them, because I have a credit card, but I pay it off every month. So I essentially use that money for a month. Leveraging they're giving, me, then they're giving me perks for using the card. So I end up making money. I become the the uh, lender and they're now. The there you go. Lender. They're your slave. They're your slave. <laughs> well, no, that's that's exactly right. Um, you know, you talked about interest. What we don't really recognize, um, and I'm going to come to uh, Scotty them. Uh, we don't realize in our adult life, we spend anywhere between 500000 to a million dollars in interest. Mm. Just interest, 500000 to a million dollars in your adult lifetime. 
And so what we're saying, and, 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 and what Brother Jimmy was saying, if we could capture the interest, mm -hmm. if I have, we, we have another two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars worth of cash flow that could be used to leverage to buy equity building assets. It can be used to offset and supplement your retirement because that's tax free money at that point. And so we've got to understand our debt situation can be once we get out of it, our blessing situation. And so we've got to recognize our interests and things of that nature. And I know with, you know, clients that we have, you know, we, we talk about, you know, let's look at your debt. Most people know, they know how much they owe on their, their, on their debt and they know how much they pay. I'm paying the minimum, I'm paying, but I pay my bill every month, but they really don't know the interest payment. Uh, and that's what's causing a major issue. And so before we go to this loans and debt, I, I saw another hand. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Scotty or Carolyn. So I have a question in reference to the topic of today and the previous topic um, that we had in reference to emergency funds and things of that nature. How do you make the decision in reference to I'm going to pay off this debt so that I can save more versus I need to save versus using the money to pay the debt down? Does, does that question make sense? Oh, it makes a great okay. it makes great sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm of the mindset. Uh, most oftentimes we are more debt conscious then we are wealth conscious. And so if I'm debt conscious, I'm, I'm either creating debt, paying debt, not necessarily building wealth. And so, so now there's a debt, I'm, I'm gonna pay that. I'm gonna pay it. I'm gonna put a little more some, some on it to get it off. But if, if money takes time to grow and you're utilizing all your time on paying off debt and it takes you five, 10, 15 years, you've lost out on compound growth opportunities. So you can either do one or the other, or you can do a kind of a balanced hybrid both and approach, but you wanna utilize as much time as you possibly can to allow money to compound so that you have more to utilize it later in life. So that's, that's a great question. It's a great question that you have to struggle with, but I think it helps you when you line up what your goals and objectives are. And then numbers don't lie. You can, you can, you can put them down together. How long is it gonna take me to pay off this bill here? And what if I had to put it over here? How much would I have in the end? Some things like that. And so, but that's a great, great thought process. And part of it also, um you need to kind of consider kind of like what's laid out here, you know, depending on what your debt situation is, you know, is it debt filled with high balances and high um, interest rates or is it low interest rates? And so it becomes an issue of weighing the cost of that debt continuing to grow versus um, the opportunity to build savings and how that can grow. So you have to kind of analyze the two, because again, if you have like in this situation, if you're stuck with student loans or mortgage and you're paying three, four, five, six percent interest, um, that's something you may consider paying the minimum while you build up this um, emergency savings. And then after you get a level of emergency savings in place, then you go back and start attacking the debt. But if you're in a situation where most of your debt is 20, 25, 30 percent, that interest is going to continue to accrue at a much higher rate much higher than um, what you could save with. So those are things you kind of have to sit down and analyze and then come up with a plan. And, and you can't, even in the scenario that Kim just gave, so if you have a low interest debt that you have, say, you know, 2% or 3% or whatever, and you say, well, I'm going to save over here, and you're putting it that savings in a bank that's giving you 0.01% then that's not a good move because you're losing on the interest over here and you're losing on inflation over here. So that's a double whammy against your, your savings or against the debt. So you just got to make sure, do the numbers. And that's why it's, I think it's very important 
to get with a financial professional. Uh, we can kind of, you know, analyze it and, and, and put together the strategy and then help hold you accountable or, or check it and see if it's working and things of that nature. But that's a great thought process in terms of um, what do I pay? Do I pay off? Do I build wealth or do I pay off debt? And, and there's, I said, there's a both and approach, I think. I see, I see real quick. I want to know how to handle debt with the IRS. They do not give breaks on penalties and interest. You want to share about that? No, they don't. They, <laughs> no, they, you, you are right about that. Um, but usually um, you can work out a payment plan with them. Um, and I think that may, I don't know offhand the, the, the length they'll go. It may be up to five years. Um, and I think even with that, the interest rate is still somewhat minimal compared to if you were using a credit card to pay off that debt. So um, one thing it would help to get a payment plan in place so that they're not trying to um, garnish any wages or put a lien on your house or anything like that. Um, but they will help you with getting a payment plan in place. Go ahead, Brother George, you're the expert. Oh, we got IRS yeah, right. All right, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you can always get an installment loan. And she's absolutely right. But here's the key. Interest is mandatory. Penalties are not. And penalties are very expensive. So naturally, you can negotiate a penalty by paying, uh, by having an installment agreement. Now, the interest is mandatory. So you pay the, uh, the balance, the tax, plus the interest. However, negotiate the penalty. They will accept it. Nice. Wow, that's great. Good to know. Negotiate the penalties. Amen. That's good. That's good. I think that's a good point right there with everything when it comes to debts and credit. Some things are negotiable. So don't be afraid to ask. Sometimes, you know, like in this situation, you have this Visa card and this 27% interest. Um, maybe you've been with this bank for 10 years and you call them up like, look, um, can you reduce my interest rate to 25 or to 20%? Don't be afraid to ask or negotiate or at least attempt because you never know what you might be able to get out of it. Or sometimes you might want to settle the debt. You know, I want to pay this off. Would you take, you know, $300 to erase this visa debt? And they may accept it. So just always ask and try to negotiate. That, that's a good point, George. Absolutely. Absolutely. So so that, that's good. And in fact, can I want to just skip to. One, yeah, let's just want to skip to this. Let's, let's just show, I want to show you just highlight one particular credit card uh, and you have a, <clears throat> so excuse the uh, the scratch, but I was working <laughs> with a client um, and we were just kind of going through this exercise. And I think uh, Ms. Carol, you, this is kind of what you're talking about, the accruing daily. Uh, but let's say you owe $5,000 on a credit card and you're paying the minimum payment every month of $100. And guess what? You're paying it every month on time or before time. And, and you feel like you're doing a great thing. And there's a 21% interest rate. But what we have to understand, that's not simple interest. That's not simple interest. Simple interest is if I give you $100 and you tell me you're gonna give me a 27% simple interest return, when you give me that money back, I get $127 back, right? That's not how this works. This is not simple interest. Your, your, your interest rate is actually a monthly monthly rate. And so you have to try to find out what the monthly rate is. And so your monthly interest rate is that 21% divided by 12. So now that's 1.75% that you're paying on a monthly basis that's compounding every month, right? So your interest payment in this particular case is you've got to, you know, that math we used to do, move the, to the, the decimal place, two places to the left so that you can get the, the number. So now you're looking at your initial payment, your interest payment of 0 0.0175 times $5,000. So now your interest payment is $87.50. So of that $100 a month that you're paying that creditor, $87.50 is going to the bank, to the creditor. $87.50 out of the 100. Out of the 100. And so your principal payment is only $12.50. So 
See, see, it, it, but we don't know that. If we don't know, if number one, if we don't know the interest, we don't understand exactly what's happening to us. So now your reality is uh, that 5,000 divided by 1250 equals 400 months. It'll take you 400 months to pay off that $5,000 credit card if you don't use it anymore. We're not even talking about you continuing to use it. 400 months. That's your reality. Now let's look at your sentence. This is a jail sentence. So now you take 400 divided by 12 and that gives you 33 years. You have a 33 year jail sentence, right? 33 years of paying $5,000 off. So now as a result, your bank is saying, I'm going to get $87.50 from your $100 for the next 33 years. So that's a total of about $35,000 profit that the credit card lender is getting off of that money. So it would take you. That's why they're like, man, I love you. You're my best client. You're paying every month on time. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And now we just made $35,000 off a $5,000 loan over 33 years. So that's what we have to understand. The interest will kill us. But if we can get to the point where we capture the interest, now we got leverage. And I think that Brother Jimmy said, we're going to make them we're going to become the lender and make them the slave and we recoup that particular interest to do something else to leverage that and that's what we're talking about that's why this is so important if we can get this and, and get out of that revolving debt uh or, or at least utilize it to our to our benefit so if i got a five thousand dollar loan or a credit card then like you said, let me pay that off. Let, let me use it for 29 days or whatever and then pay it all off because now I'm not paying any interest. But I've utilized that credit, hopefully, to build. Um, <laughs> somebody said I choose the wrong career. I know, right? We need to be, we need to be in the lending business. But guess what? You can be. But that's just it. You can do that. You can create <laughs> strategies where you become the lender a private lending, and you can create your own bank to do exactly that. And so those are some of the things that we talk about. Those are some of the strategies that we help our clients do. And now, instead of paying interest, you're receiving interest mm -hmm. uh, and you're utilizing that to, to create and build equity building assets so, so that you will have an inheritance for your children's children. And as long as you got seed in the earth, there's one thing that you'll never have to worry about is money and economics. That's where God wants us to be. That should be your last concern. Well, do I have enough money to do this ministry? You no, know, God's like, you got it. You've got the power. It's now about putting these strategies into action, becoming disciplined, setting smart goals, holding yourself accountable and, and seeing it through and, and you'll see the shift. You'll see the economic shift right before your eyes and you'll be dancing like Miss Mary every month because, <laughs> because you, you see the reality of, of your debts moving to wealth. And that's what it's all about. That's good, Sean. Um, I just did a quick calculation. This is an example of a $5,000 balance on a credit card at 21%. So, um, Let's say the average mortgage is $250,000. So if you took that, this example times 50, that'll get you a balance of $250,000. Mm -hmm. Now granted, most people are not paying 21% interest on a mortgage, but just to kind of illustrate again, the over 30 years, that $35,000 profit that we're paying to the bank that times 50 is $1.75 million. So it's easy to see how over a lifetime we're spending 500,000 to a million dollars in interest payments that again, if we had a way to keep more of that in our possession, we would have more to apply to lend to others or to acquire um, equity building assets. Absolutely. We, we, so we're, we're basically, we're already wealthy. Yeah. Still. You know, you, you, you were born wealthy. <laughs> Somebody's just been taking 
your identity. They've been taking all the stuff that God had in store for you and they've been extrapolating it from us. And now we're saying, I want all my stuff back. It's like that quote, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Absolutely. And so that's, you can see how that applies here. Any um, comments or questions? I want to see if I can get back to it. Uh... Uh, yes, Reverend Sean says something that was very key. Um, and it's a biblical principle that we may be able to uh, help out our children's children. My grandson, my oldest grandson by my daughter has uh, gone into his own entrepreneurial business. 18 Wheeler, 18 Wheeler. All He's right. All right. Back right now, he went and picked the truck up uh, this week from Denver, um, Denver, Colorado. And if he paid for that truck by way of a loan, he will be paying $100,000 in interest based on this principle you just gave. But he has his grandparents now since we have flipped the house. Amen. <laughs> Glory. Just got to keep it with the Bible. And it always, when we do things the Bible way, we get Bible results. Okay. Come on now. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That That's great stuff. That's great stuff. And so that's what we're talking about. Go ahead, Jimmy. I see your hand, sir, on the 18th hole. Jimmy, you're on mute if you're talking. Okay. Establishing our grandson as an entrepreneur. He's begun a trucking business and now. Amen. That's no, I just said huge. that. I just said yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's huge. That's huge. I thought Jimmy had his hand up. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, once <laughs> once you accept if you accept that there's really a need to have an emergency fund, what we've talked about earlier, you've got to have a budget, and then you've got to put a budget that allows you to hit your end goal, the emergency fund, mm -hmm. invest in, in a, accumulating assets. If you do that, you'll make some the right decisions with your budget. You may, we need, in a Charlotte, you need a car if you're trying to work, but you don't need to get that dream Maserati. Come on you now. You need to get a Toyota Prius so that you understand its interest rate so it now doesn't hamper you so that you can't invest or can't save. Absolutely. And so, Brother Jimmy, you're absolutely right. And that's why we started off with the psychology of money, mm -hmm. right? And then you move from the psychology of money to, to budgeting. You need to have a spending plan, a, a saving plan, so that if you have a budget that, in, that entails your emergency spending or your emergency saving, that now you're in position. You know where your money is. You can give an account of your money every penny of it. And so now you don't make an, an emotional decision. That's part of that psychology, right? I know you've been giving me these, pro, trying to program my mind to buy these things, but guess what? It's not in my budget. It's not in my, my mm -hmm. smart goals for my life. And so I, I, now I'm more equipped to say no to that emotional manipulation because I wanna stay steadfast, unmovable on my particular goals. And so that's what helps us to, uh, with these particular strategies. So great word, brother Jimmy, great word. Can you speak more on how to benefit from a 15 year mortgage? We're trying to refinance third attempt and we want to be comfortable with a high mortgage payment. Okay. So so just think about this, um, it, it kind of what we just showed. If you have a 30 year mortgage at 4% interest, you're talking about 15 extra years of paying 4% interest, compounding. And so if you can knock just, just in simple math, if you can knock the mortgage payment down in half, you're actually saving more than half of the money that you're putting on the mortgage because of the interest, if that makes sense. Cut the mortgage term in half. So if you cut the mortgage term in half and pay it off in 15 years, that extra money that you're paying in interest the next 15 years can be used to, to, to bring interest to you. You know, you can put that in a, a, a money market or IUL that's going to give you a, a index type returns. And so now that money is working for you and your house is now building equity as well. So now you have equity in your house. You, you freed up the money that you would have been using to pay interest, you're utilizing that to, to build wealth with. So that's just a real simple way to do that. And so if you are refinancing uh, to get a lower interest rate, 
that's great. Uh, the question becomes now, what are you going to do? And I think this was the question earlier. What are you going to do with the difference in, in the mortgage payment on a, every month? Do you pay off a 3% mortgage loan or do you take that extra balance that you got back and put it somewhere where it can build four, five, six, seven percent interest in growth? So those are those are the things that we have to have discussions about and, and put together a plan to figure out what's the best strategy for us in this particular situation. And if you're having if you're not able to get the refinance, there's still strategies you can um employ yourself to attack that mortgage. So whether it's paying an extra, you know, paying it twice a month, where you, at the end of the year, you've ended up paying one extra mortgage payment, or if you're adding, you know, X amount of dollars to each mortgage payment, there's different strategies you can use to help attack that um, in the midst of trying to get it refinanced if that's something that's not um, happening right away for you. So there, there's various ways. Yes, yes, absolutely. And we can talk about that. Um, I just wanted to show this this uh, example. Again, this could be a typical person's um, debt situation. And given some of the things we've talked about, let's say in their budget, they have an extra 50 to $100 a month. What would be the suggestion on where to apply that if their goal is to reduce their debt and get out of debt? Because again, it varies, but you know, we call there's the snowball method and the high interest uh, method, which we call the avalanche method. Um, again, they both work for um, different types and different types of situation, different personalities. Um, but either one, you can take, you know, either try to reduce the month of months to pay it off by attacking that balance, or you might want to attack, you know, the highest interest rate or attack the smallest balance. So um, again, it, it's, it's analysis you have to sit down and kind of walk through to see what works for you and what you can commit to. Um, any other comments just on well, this? Well, I think Jimmy has, a he, he put it in the chat. You oh. can get a low interest 30 year uh, mortgage to minimize your commitment to pay, uh, but pay as a 15 year mortgage. So mm -hmm. in this case, maybe doubling up or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the case is. And that way you'll, you'll decrease that mortgage in, in half. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I know it's what 1119. Um, but Jessica has one more question for us. What's the best strategy to pay off student loan debt? Because income based repayment doesn't help with the interest that is accruing. Mm -hmm. So again, that, that's just another debt opportunity um, where, again, you have to analyze your whole situation to figure <laughs> out um, how best to attack that. So again, usually with your student loans, it has a lower uh, interest. Um, so again, if that's your only debt, then that's one thing. If you're competing with credit card debt where you have a 20 or 25% um, interest, those are things you want to actually analyze and really figure out the best strategy. So it's, it kind of depends and you have to kind of go through um, case by case. Yeah. Don't be waiting on uh, President Biden. I don't, man, listen, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> if we can get that taken care of, let's do that. And so, you know, again, that's something that, you know, Joyce and I can certainly help you with, help you create that strategy and find out the best plan for you as well. All right. So, Go ahead. This is just up. kind of a uh, just kind of recap some of the things as far as how to address um, your loans and debts. Um, contact all your creditors, and as we talked about earlier, um, you know if there's an opportunity to negotiate something, you know don't be afraid to ask. You know verify what your current interest rate is, how much you owe, the minimum monthly payment, and whether or not they can reduce your um, interest rate, or if they have any other specials going on that could help you in your situation. But kind of as we just um, highlighted, list all your debts on the spreadsheet. List the credit card, um, list the interest rate, list the um, the balance due. Yeah. Um, and it, it really helps to have all that laid out in one um, snapshot for you to review. Um, and again, depending on what strategy works for you, you know, sometimes you might have to start with one strategy, then switch over to the next. Right. Or maybe you're doing the snowball strategy where you're paying off the minimum 
and then taking that money when it's freed up to attack the next one. But every now and then you might get a lump sum of money. So, you know, whether it's a tax refund or whether, you know, it's a, a sale of a house. Yeah. You know, just <laughs> have a plan in place for when you have large sums, lump sums of right. money, how do you utilize that to attack your debt? Right. So um, incorporate that into your plan. Um, I think the last two are really just talking about the strategies, yeah. but um, I think, you know, the goal of what we were trying to do today with, you know, talking about debt is just understanding the opportunities of, you know, that $35,000 has paid over 33 years to pay off $5,000. I hope that's um, very enlightening to say, well, let, let's get this debt paid off as quickly as possible so that um, hundred dollars a month could be going towards equity building or investments building. or saving yeah. wealth building opportunities for me so that I can accumulate that $35,000 versus the bank. Amen. So. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's it. I mean, this has been, hopefully this has been eye opening. It's been great for me. And just again, our collective wisdom as a community is so powerful because you learn a little from here and a little from there but it's about taking action. You know, you know, it's one thing to be a hearer of God's word, but you've got to become a doer. That's where the fruit comes in. When you start doing what you know, that's when you start operating in wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of the knowledge that you have acquired. And I believe you've acquired some knowledge today. Now, the question is, what are you going to do? That's what we want. Uh, a call to action and kind of go from there. So obviously we have our class surveys. You guys are filling those out. Uh, I just posted earlier at the beginning of the class. Yeah, so do we need to post that again? Just if not, uh, if we, yeah, that's fine. And then if you, financial needs assessments, uh, certainly if you want to sit down and you, you get a complimentary financial needs assessment, several of you have done that. And we've already begun strategies for you. And I think it's been a blessing. Uh, if you want to do that, you can, you can certainly do that. And uh, again, just, just take action. Just, just trust the process. Uh, change our mindset. Uh, be diligent. Um, and God's going to definitely do the, do the rest. Amen. Um, in, any closing comments? And I think Jimmy says uh, we have somebody to do prayer. Minister Usury, is that right? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Something and took me out of the class. Okay. okay. If everyone is ready, let us pray. I'm sorry. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to learn, Lord, about how we can become better stewards, Lord, of what you have given to us. Because truly, Lord God, everything that we have comes from you. Your word declares everything that's good and perfect comes from you, Lord, and that includes our finances. Father, we ask that you would help us to retain this information, and not just to retain it, Lord God, but to utilize it, Lord. You said in your word that even our faith, if we don't put it to work, is dead. So, mm -hmm. Lord, let us take this information and use it, and God, continue to bless um, Reverend Sean and, 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 and Sister Kim and Sister Joyce, as they go forth, Lord God, to empower your kingdom, mm -hmm. Lord God, that we may be more enlightened on how we can be better stewards of that which you have given to us. God, you have placed them here and you have given us the freedom to come and learn from them. And God, what a gift that you have given to us for such a time as this. So, Father, as we come down to the close of this class, as always, always, Lord, we give your name the glory, we give your name the honor, and we give your name the praise. This is our prayer. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the blessed Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Good word. Good, Good prayer. class. So again, you guys have your student workbooks. If you go back and look at this section, there's a couple exercises in there that help reinforce some of the things we talked about. So I encourage you to do that between now and the next class. Brother Jimmy, did All right. you? All right. Yeah. Thank you uh, for, for this class today. If nothing else, if we have a lot of debt, it should scare us to death. <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Sounds good. Well, that drive, it drive us to action. It should drive us. It right. should drive us to action. Right. Absolutely, Amen. absolutely. That's even better. Amen. Sounds good. Well, God bless you all. Uh, enjoy your weekend and uh, get out of debt and build some wealth and be a blessing to someone. In Jesus' name, Amen. Peace and love. Amen. Bye. God bless. Bless you. Thank you, guys.